آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The date today is and I hope I even get this correct the 24th of the 8th uh, 2023 and we are in now because it's after Maghrib the 9th of Safar 1445 and I am joined by my special guest sorry I keep looking over this way our special guest just to see how he rates me uh, we are joined by our special guest international guest all the way from Houston America brother Daniel Ha'i'aju how are you brother Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. I'm doing well. Did I say it correctly? Yeah, you can pronounce it. Hayraju, Haqiqatju. All of them. All of them are fine. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm close. So even if I was wrong, I was close. And I hope uh, close gets me a pass. We are at Alban Studios in Belmore, Sydney, Australia. And Daniel is here. Uh, he's come to check out Australia, Alhamdulillah. And we hope that he likes it. We've had the pleasure of uh, spending some time with you in the past few days. And we do know, as we've mentioned before, and I'm, I know you know about yourself, that there are some uh, question marks, there are some controversies, there are some misunderstandings, and all of that, inshallah, Azza wa we want to clarify. And so we thought, in terms of a sit-down on the radio, online, why don't we do a you know podcast style called Misunderstood? And we want it to be about you, and we'll just shoot off questions, not by your haters, not by your enemies, not by people that may be a little bit unfair or extremely biased in their approach, but people that know you, people that like you, people that follow you, but maybe they uh, have some questions about certain matters that inshallah Azza wa Jalla, they would have liked to have asked you, but they don't have access for whatever reason. And so uh, we thought we'll do it on their behalf inshallah. Uh, and or people that maybe they don't know you. And so they say, you know what? There's this Daniel brother with a confusing last name. Uh, he's come all the way international guest speaker i don't know who he is let me find out who he is you go online mashallah the guy's got like hundreds of videos and then there's people talking about him also who is he Allah, who is he this is inshallah one of those things that we hope they can easily tune into without getting into the questions yet just briefly how's your time been in australia so far i'm doing very good enjoy my time with the uh shuyukh, the imams and the community brothers here are so uh, hospitable i really enjoyed my time so far so all as well. And Why are you controversial? <laughs> <laughs> Again, you've only got segue. three minutes for that one. Yeah. We're doing good so far with time. Yeah, I, I really, that's a good question. I don't know why I'm controversial. Um, maybe you can explain it to me, but I just try, like, one of the things that is controversial, I talk about controversial subjects. I talk about subjects where you have a dominant ideology, the status quo that's attacking Islam. You know, there are certain teach like feminism. Feminism is telling Muslims that, you know, you're backwards for thinking that there are gender roles. You're backwards for thinking there are two genders. You're backwards for thinking that, you know, husbands have certain rights and responsibilities. Wives have certain rights and responsibilities. Husbands should be the leaders of their household. Uh, men should be leaders of the community. Things like of that nature, gender issues. So that's going to be controversial because it's going against the status quo. And unfortunately, you have some Muslims who will adopt the status quo even though it's coming from non-muslims they will adopt the dominant kufri status quo and then they'll have a big problem with someone who is saying hey actually this status quo is contrary to islam and is actually detrimental to the muslim community they don't want to hear that so mm -hmm. they attack me for that reason and that's a small example like gender issues is one issue interfaith issues like okay why are some muslims uh, and even some imams or scholars, they're compromising Islam for the sake of this watered down Abrahamic religion, for example, or what have you. No. And then if you criticize that, you're accused of being jealous or you want to actually, oh, you're attacking the scholars. Uh, so that's the source of controversy. But the ki kind of things that I say, it's not like a, it's a very... Uh, you know, innovated fiqh position that no one has ever heard of and I'm putting that out there and therefore you're, that's causing controversy. No, there's nothing that I say that isn't well established in the consensus of the ulama in history, in Islamic history. Do you think, because we have a minute left for that answer, do you think sometimes the controversy may, may be from ways that you say certain things or we may get to a bit later, but words used or Maybe the approach to it. So what you're saying is correct. 
you know, as a comment, they say, what you're saying is correct, but the way that you said it was the controversial part, or people got offended, they took it the wrong way, not because your message wasn't correct, but because maybe the way you said it, do you think that could be part of it? Not to smash you, I'm just uh, yeah. asking. No, it's a good question. question. Um, this is something that I was told for a long time. So, you know, I've been doing Dawa, as I mentioned, for the past um, 11 years, maybe. And this is one of the criticisms I got as I got into more uh, controversial issues. Um, and so I actually wrote an article in 2014 on this issue of catcalling. Uh, mm -hmm. Because this was a big controversy uh, in 2014 in the mainstream media. Oh, women are getting harassed and they're being catcalled when they walk on the street. They don't feel safe. Um, and then I wrote this article saying that, yeah, it's completely wrong, unacceptable for any man to whistle at or call, catcall a woman. Uh, but there is another dim dimension to this issue. Women are dressed inappropriately. Many women are going out dressed inappropriately. And this is a type of sexual harassment uh, because they're displaying themselves in mm -hmm. this kind of provocative way to society around them. So they should be held accountable for the kind of dress that they have. That doesn't justify attacking them. Yes. That doesn't justify any kind of violence ag against them or harassment. But they should be seen as doing something very immoral and wrong. So you can imagine, <laughs> publish this article and immediately get attacked as this and that. But even surprisingly amongst uh, very uh, religious Muslim women practicing uh, modestly and they care about hijab, they care about niqab, they care about all of that haya, they also were criticizing me and they couldn't point out, oh, this well, well. is actually wrong in terms of the content of what you said. It's wrong because, oh, you're just not nice about it. But then, so I realized at that point and thereafter, what was not nice about what I said? I was much more polite and much more diplomatic, actually, back in 2014. And I realized that, no, you don't, it's, you can't answer the objection. You can't actually provide a counter argument to what I'm saying. So this is just an excuse that you're using that, oh, you're just saying it in the wrong way. Your tone is incorrect. So I completely, uh, I found out at that point that these tone objections or tone policing is not really substantive. It's an excuse because you can't address the substantive issue. Especially like in today's online world where everything is like conflated and there aren't consequences and there's echo chambers and comment sections and all those kind of <laughs> funny things. To me, I always say the comment section is the jungle of stupidity. Yeah. Uh, where did you receive your Islamic education? It, because when I entered college, that's when my Islamic re learning, like you could say traditional learning, really began. Prior to that, it wasn't v much at all, if anything. Um, so I actually learned how to read Quran in college. Um, mm -hmm. Then shortly thereafter, I learned how to, you know, recite with tajweed, you know, basic rules of tajweed, etc. Started studying uh, some basic fiqh, um, you know, hadith, tafsir of the Quran, all basic stuff. And then I just progressed over time. And to this day, I'm still studying. And alhamdulillah, you know, it's just a continuous journey. But I haven't graduated from an official institution or I do not yet have like that kind of official degree. Alhamdulillah. May Allah Azza bless you with it and increase your Islamic knowledge. And again, as you mentioned, uh, maybe you haven't done X, Y, Z in Islamic studies. But that doesn't mean that what you mention, what you speak about, you don't necessarily know. Because some people, they conflate mm -hmm. the two. And that's incorrect. So, if, you know, preach about me, even if it's one verse, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned. So, if you know something, you're allowed to speak about it. Uh, is there any particular sheikh that you want to or can mention? Um, and I say can, because some people, they misunderstand. Sometimes you may have a sheikh that you don't want him to receive, you know, unsolicited backlash for no reason. You know, maybe he's living his life and then you mention his name and then tomorrow you wake up and he's calling you crying because, you know, he's got someone... <laughs> at the front of his house blaming uh, him for you. <laughs> yeah. So is there any particular sheikh that you feel uh, molded you in those years or assisted you in those years that you want to you know, maybe mention or, or speak about? Yeah, I'm just careful about mentioning the specific names of teachers uh, because I have to get their permission first. And there's so much backlash like with some of these people online that are literally targeting my house. <laughs> they post my address online. They, you know, attack my my family. Um, so Alhamdulillah hasn't got to the point of attacking my children, but maybe that will come down the line too. And I am surprised by the amount of hate 
So that's why it's mentioning specific teachers. But then there's a muscle and there's a mafsada. Sometimes there's a, a benefit, but then there can also be harms. And it's important in people uh, for un- to understand that in a position like yours, I don't have that same fitna, alhamdulillah. So I can see and say, okay, my sheikh is this person, this person, this person, because inshallah, nothing's going to happen to them, inshallah. Mm. But uh, in a situation where, you know, maybe your views are in the hundreds of thousands or sometimes maybe even the millions, and if people don't like you, they aren't 100,000 or 200,000 followers. They may be split right down the middle, which is a big number. And you don't know how someone else is going to cop abuse. And you don't want that on that person. Sometimes a person is a simple imam. He goes, he leads the salah, he gives khutbah jumu'ah, he gives some reminders, he goes home. There's no controversy in his life. And sometimes out of uh, fear for their safety or fear for even their lifestyle, their mental health or whatever it may be, that's not the pressure that you want to bring upon them. So it's very important for people to realize that if you want to know who Daniel's Mashaykh are and you're a person who has a reason to know, you can go and sit with him personally. If there's a reason to know, and there can be in a manner. Okay, I've got followers. I come and say, Daniel, I want to know who your mashayikh are so that I can say to my followers, it's, I'll, I'll give you the tick of approval. Uh, as opposed to who are they online so that بالله, they can get attacked. This is not something that uh, we promote at all. The other thing also is that I don't claim to be a shaykh. I don't care, claim to be an alim. I don't, I'm not an imam. I don't have that position of authority, religious authority anywhere where I'm going and teaching people. If that were the case, I think it's important to have the correct authorization to do so. You have to have an ijazah. You have to have a sanad. You have to have this. Um, that's very, very important in deen. So I'm not trying to say that this is, oh, I just feel uncomfortable and maybe there's a danger. So therefore, I'm going to keep it private. No, that's not my argument. My argument is that, well, I'm not even claiming to be a sheikh, and I'm not uh, opining, I'm not putting out any kind of view that requires authorization. It's mm-hmm. very basic, fundamental things like haya is important. You know, the, uh, the rights and responsibilities of the husband or wife are important. Gender roles are important. Uh, certain kinds of behaviors, uh, sexual behaviors are haram or they're, um, you know, Fawahish. Those are basic standard things. You don't need to be a sheikh to be able to say such a thing. Yeah, it's uh, as I was mentioning earlier, it was this challenge of modernism, liberalism, secularism, feminism against Islam. And it's kind of my personality where I am very offended by people who claim to be so smart (laughs) and claim to be so superior and they turn up their noses at Islam. Um, It just offends me to a great degree. And I feel like, you know, making them belittling them in the same way that they belittle Islam. And so I was learning more about Islam in college. And as I was learning more, there was I see that there are. Um, non-Muslims who are attacking Islam. There are Muslims who are adopting some of these ideologies and they're they're becoming liberal Muslims, feminist Muslims, and they also look down on traditional uh, ulama, the tradition itself, the Islamic tradition itself. And so I am motivated to uh, respond to them and to fight back against them and uh, argue against them. So I was very active uh, in college in these kinds of debates. Uh, with graduate students, with some of these professors actually um, that were at the university and other universities on email forms. I don't know if that's a thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all on WhatsApp. And yeah, that was that way before platforms. WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. Way before WhatsApp, way before Facebook and social media. So on the email forums, I was just you know typing away the uh, refutations. And it was just based on liberalism again. Like they're trying to liberalize Islam, reform Islam, say, you know, well, we need to, we had this kind of hukum on this issue, but that's like days, that's for days of old. Now we, ha- we have a new situation. We need to find new solutions for our time and our place. So this just angers me and annoys me. And I, the reason that you're trying to reform Islam is because you've adopted this ideology as superior. Uh, but why? Why have you adopted this ideology as superior? This ideology is trash. We need to throw this out. And then when you do that, you see that Islam is superior and Islam, whatever Islam has legislated, whatever Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa have legislated is superior, is better. So why are we re- trading what is superior to, for trash? 
So this is the kind of argu that, you know, pushed me towards doing more dawa because I started writing online. I created a blog just for the purpose of refuting uh, evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the atheists are putting yeah. this uh, claim, oh, human beings and chimpanzees share 99% of their DNA. This means that evolution is true and the idea of God creating human beings is ridiculous. Just refuting that. And then another aspect, big aspect of what I do is you can call it accountability reports. So I accountability is something that I think has been missing from the Western Dawa in that you have certain imams that gain an immense popularity online, but qualified authorities are not actually auditing what these people and or these institutions are putting online. So I'm not going to name any names, but the fact is that if you actually go through their material and a qualified sheikh will, would go through their material, they would find many mistakes. Uh, where I'm well placed to do this work is that with individuals that aren't making like small mistakes, they're making huge and mm. ginormous mistakes that even a uh, lay person like me can identify very clearly that this is wrong or this is misleading, as well as basically being like an auditor. And when you're an auditor, you're never really well loved. <laughs> People will hate you for, you know, even if you're right. So there are a lot of challenges uh, to Muslims in the West, and it really depends on what is your level of practice and of Islam. Uh, so I think that with uh, certain Muslims, materialism and dunya is a big problem. Another category of Muslims, shahawat, are a big problem, a big challenge. Uh, I think the big challenge for the Muslims who are very practicing, they're knowledgeable, they care deeply about deen, they care deeply about learning uh, Islam. Their big challenge maybe is tawakkul, uh, reliance and having trust in Allah, in the sense that they sometimes, some of them may not be confident enough to face the challenges posed by uh, this liberal status quo. And that's where, without that kind of tawakkul, and tawakkul is what gives you confidence. When you trust in Allah, then you are confident to face a challenge and even a huge enemy. And we see this from the Anbiya. How are the Anbiya able to face major enemies who are more powerful, they're more wealthy in dunya sense, um, they're, they have more resources, yet these MBS stand up against them and they declare the truth. So how do we emulate those MBS? We have to have tawakkul and we have to have confidence that what Islam is presenting, uh, the message of Islam to the world is so much superior, uh, not only spiritually superior, but also rationally superior, also morally superior than what these other ideologies are that we are told through propaganda, through media, is actually superior to Islam. You have to have, e because you might not know, okay, if you've been indoctrinated, for example, like many Muslims in this day and age are, you've been brainwashed by all of this educational system, media propaganda, you might not know exactly why, you know, um, uh, khilafa and or this or sharia is superior to democratic representationalism and secularism you might not know intellectually the right answer but if you have that confidence and trust in allah um, that what he has sent is superior then you ha have taken the first step to resist that ideology to resist that propaganda and then in the future inshallah you can um, learn the arguments. You can uh, find out the arguments yourself or you can find out from others. So that's, I think, is the really big challenge. I haven't heard that, that one as a tawakkul. For someone to single it out, I haven't heard it, I think, before. For Jazakallah mm -hmm. uh, What do you f believe are the three main challenges to Muslims in the Muslim world? I think it's the same thing. It's the same lack of, because it depends on who, which... Uh, group of Muslims you're talking about, they'll have different challenges. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the, um, you know, the, the, what's the word for it? The, the ones who are leading the masajid, the imams, the ones who are teachers, the ones who are um, in charge of the Islamic universities, they're the, they're the imams who need to hold strong against these forces of liberalization. If they don't hold strong, then they're going to reform. They're going to be more inclined to compromise. They're going to be more inclined to water down uh, Dean 
because of that lack of confidence. So this advice for Tawakkul, this advice for standing strong is really directed towards that group. You don't want to add another two? <laughs> uh, well, the thing is that th that... Well, it's so ex ex comprehensive that yeah, there's it makes like, up for there, it. There are certain manifestations of that main problem, that, that main disease, because you have people who are like calling for reform. So reformism is a big challenge. People who want to water down or change the deen, they want to introduce innovations. Uh, they want to transform Islamic society to match a kind of Western society. Um, they want to change Islamic marriage to represent the kind of Western equality marriage. They want to change Islamic education to represent like a Western style university system. Those kinds of reforms, that's coming from the same root disease of a lack of confidence in Islam. Is it necessary to use certain possibly mm -hmm. offensive language with others? Uh, it can be necessary for sure. So when I use it, um, if I use harsh language and mocking language, that is something actually permissible. It's something that the ulama have said that you, when it comes to Ahlul Bid'ah and it comes to Fusaq, people who are um, openly promoting deviance, Zanadiqa, uh, they're promoting, or, or even Murtaddin, people of that nature. Um, in the benefit it, of mocking them is that so they will be belittled in the eyes of the Muslims and in the eyes of the people. And therefore, it is actually permissible. And in certain cases, it might be uh, necessary to mock them, to belittle them. And this is actually, people say, oh, well, is this prophetic? Is this something that is part of the uh, sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And the reality is that it is uh, because um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged Hassan ibn Thabit, the Sahabi, radiallahu anhu, to, he was writing poetry against the Quraysh. And he was actually mocking the Quraysh and insulting them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approved of that because it was effective. It would reduce their morale. It would re reduce their morale and it would boost the morale of the believers. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went so far as to say that to make dua that Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam is going to assist you with with the kind of that poetry, the mockery. So not only did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approve, even Jibreel, Angel Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam approves and is supporting that. So as far as the hukum and is this permissible? Yes, it is permissible and it could even be encouraged. But it has to be done with wisdom. It has to be done like if you have a weapon, you just don't, you know, wave the weapon carelessly. You have to use the weapon in a very judicious, uh, intelligent for way. And that's what I try to do. It's only with people who have proven that they are stubborn in their innovation, they're stubborn in their fisk, they're stubborn in their kufr, and some of them even are uh, will attack Islam and they will mock Islam. So if they are mocking Islam, like imagine some of these uh, kufar or these enemies of Islam, they're mocking Islam, then it's permissible and it could be encouraged to reciprocate that uh, against them. So I don't see, you know, what's the problem with the use of mockery. Uh, what about if we say in terms of mockery, we have those that, somewhat like mockery or could be like name calling. I don't want to get too specific with individual. I don't want to mention names. Mm -hmm. But let's say people that are closer to Ahl Sunnah. Like they are Ahl Sunnah, but they maybe have some flaws or mistakes or errors. Uh, obviously, you're not going to attack them as you know, crazily as you would attack or you're going to use the same words that you would use for someone that is you know, an atheist or uh, he's a murtad, ayyadhan billah. Um, that's attacking Islam day and night. Someone who is promoting Islam, they love Islam, um, but they have some mistakes. We're going to get into some of the correcting of those mistakes and discussing those mistakes. But let's say with them, if someone comes and says, Daniel, I love you. Uh, I I hope in like nothing but good happens to you and your da'wah is blessed. But I feel that maybe some of the words that you use with other brothers that they're Muslim, they're Sunni, but they have an issue or there's a disagreement or they see this is more correct. Can you like be a bit more soft on your words, in your words? Yeah, so I would just question the premise of the question that are they really that close to the Sunnah wal Jama'ah? Are they really close to the Sunnah, the Quran and Sunnah? Are they really? Um, the individuals that I will mock and criticize, I'm doing that because they're not close 
to the Quran and Sunnah, and they are brazen, and they're the the toxicity, the danger of what they're promoting is so severe that it requires that kind of response. So, for example, like one of the nicknames that one of these guys that I mock has is Imam Sandwich. Okay, I won't tell you who that is, but Imam Sandwich. Why does you not trying to make a fed joke? Yeah, huh? You're not making a fed joke, man. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just want to make sure because <laughs> they no, could Imam, be dramas. <laughs> Imam Sandwich likes them. No, we don't mock you know a person for their looks. Mm. Imam Sandwich is someone who has hundreds, basically, or dozens, let's say, dozens conservatively, of pictures where he is sandwiched between two women. You know, uh, okay. and, and it's like it's public. <laughs> yeah, not okay. because he likes the. Yeah, you know, I thought you were trying sandwich. to like. I thought you were trying to be offensive. I'm like far out. <laughs> So you were saying, yeah. Sheikh, my apologies, yeah, Imam, Imam Sandwich. sandwich. Yeah. I so, didn't call him Imam Sandwich. <laughs> I'm just going back to the point that he was saying of why. Just so no one comes and smashes me. You laughed. so I laughed at the you, concept. <laughs> I don't know who he is. Okay, I don't know who he is. I just laughed at the concept. So once it was explained who it was. Okay. Don't backtrack. So it was, yeah. In that case, as I was saying, this is someone who just openly is promoting this. People have criticized him for it. They've corrected him privately. They've corrected him publicly. But this is like what he just likes to do. He likes to take the photo ops, you know, yeah. sandwich between women. So, okay, we're going to mock that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, without being too specific, do you believe they can own or I suppose they're wrong? Do you, be, uh, without being too specific, do you believe there can and or needs to be a level, a level of compromise regarding certain matters in the West that may be black and white in Sharia because of our reality? That's a broader answer, and you like, I know you've only got three minutes, so I apologize. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that there should be any compromise. I mean, if you give me a specific example, maybe I can. So, uh, for example, where. Let's say in Sharia, ah, um, you know, the halal and haram are clear. Um, so you wouldn't support someone, let's say in politics, you wouldn't support someone who is uh, running for politics who is clearly has like major wrongs, major wrongs. Um, but let's say in the West, where if you are, and we're going to speak a little bit about politics as well, if you are completely away from dealing or engaging in a positive way with politicians, then it's not necessarily someone that you want to be linked with or you necessarily want to give your full support to. But if you don't support any yani life in general, da'wah, when I say life, I mean da'wah in general, your masjid, your Islamic school, your um, uh, your regulations can become like very, very, very hard. I'll give you an example. In, uh, in But is this something like black and white clearly prohibited in the Sharia? No, no, we're talking about someone. So in the Sharia, let's say uh, someone is, you would not support them. You would have like a much better alternative, mm -hmm. or the hope would be anyway, yeah. that in an Islamic state you would have a much better uh, Islamic alternative. And so, if you had an Islamic alternative and a non-Islamic alternative, you're obviously going to go with the Islamic alternative. Whereas what we have here is, even in the Sharia, you will find many actually uh, actual uh, uh, what do they call it uh, instances where. Precedence, uh, the precedence. You find a precedence where even Umar when, when he was asked about, do we select someone who's righteous but not as good for the job, or someone who is a bit more like not as righteous? We we'll use not as righteous but is better for the job. And and he used to say that righteousness is for him personally, whereas his goodness and qualifications for the job is for the the ummah. That's what we're worried about. So he may not be the most righteous person, but is he the best person for the job? But we're talking about someone who, let's say, he will completely support the LGBTQIA plus community who will completely support them and the you know rights for marriage and everything and that he is active in that but at the same time uh he's willing to give the muslims a fair go at the same time so you're not sending this you know what we endorse everything that he does but uh having a healthy relationship with him uh or her in politics in the west uh is going to make life for muslims generally speaking easier as opposed to saying you know what we're completely away and then life in da'wah becomes uh, a lot, lot, lot harder. Not for you as an individual, because for you, like you give da'wah here or you give da'wah there, but for Muslims as a whole, like um, a practical example here in Australia is a lot of the time like the masajid. Mm -hmm. Some of the masajid have become under like very, 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 very strict conditions. Very strict conditions. So like they had to like escalate these types of matters and really engage with councils and really engage with you know, politicians to say, What's happening is unfair. And then so some sort of reforms happen. So it's like some will look at it and say, this is a clear-cut matter. These people, they support that much bad that you need to stay away from them completely. 
Others will say, uh, no, it's a lot more nuanced than you think. And I hate that word. It's a lot more gray than you think. And we are looking at the best interests of the Muslims. And so we're not compromising and saying we agree. We agree with what they're saying or we agree with what they are doing. But the compromise is in dealing with certain individuals that maybe they, their character is unsavory or you pref you would prefer not to do with them, but you do with them for the greater good of the Muslims. That's their perspective. Yeah, and I think that any politician is going to be doing, it's not just supporting LGBTQ or whatever. Um, most of these politicians, 99%, 99.9%, are supporting complete batil, complete kufr, obviously. And But does that necessarily mean that you should have no relationship? But the thing is, how do you define that relationship? Because um, I think everyone can agree it would be better to have politicians that no matter what kind of facade they're doing, they still are not turning against Muslims. They're still not attacking Muslims. And maybe they're even promote like supporting Muslims and Muslim institutions. I think everyone agrees that insofar as you're living in these non-Muslim countries, you want the ruling class or the government to at least have a space for Muslims and even better, even support Muslim institutions by whatever, whatever means. I think everyone agrees with that. There's just a question of strategy. And you can get the, the thing that some Muslims may not be aware of is that the you can get something out of these government officials uh, in multiple ways. One way is to just compromise and to bend the knee and to become basically like the dogs of these politicians. And they will supposedly help you. But in reality, they're, they're not going to care about you because you've already given them the, you, your support and become they're dogs. So they're going to mistreat you and they're going to ignore you. Um, and this is the um, problem that happened that occurred with a lot of Muslim communities in the past 10 years. They really compromised their deen for the sake of cozying up to the liberal left. And it was a kind of relationship of subservience. And you're going to compromise your principles on many a aspects of Islam for the sake of, you know, us considering you as at the table and part of the group. Mm -hmm. Um, along with other communi communities, quote unquote, as they call it, um, so that's a that's a way to ha to influence government, kufr government, in the wrong way. The right way, in my opinion, is to have an oppositional relationship to the government, to uh, make demands of the government, and to pursue legal means. This kind of oppositional approach is much more effective because you are uh, you are interacting with the government on your own terms according to your principles and you're using legal means to pressure the government to uh, support your interests and this is what all interest groups who are effective actually do there it's a it's an oppositional relationship not a compromised relationship so that's what I think Muslims uh, can do without compromising the Sharia, without violating the Sharia, without and really serving Muslim interests without compromise. So what are your views on political activism and or engagement? Yeah, like I said, that political activism, is it an oppositional activism? Is it an activism that is trying to hold people in authority accountable uh, by s Islamic standards? Um, I think that type of activism is good. And that's the type of acti activism that we see from the Anbiya. Uh, in many of the stories of the prophets, we see that they're in non-Muslim societies, but they are speaking on social issues, on moral issues, and they are doing islah, and they're in their call to tawhid. So those things go hand in hand. And that's the message of the Quran as well. So in this non-Muslim societies in which we live, um, speaking the truth is activism. Um, so no doubt about it, that is a part of Islam and it's necessary. Unfortunately, some have misinterpreted activism to mean that, oh, you follow the social justice warriors and you have to be adopt their ideologies like critical race theory, like feminism, like um, woke ideology. And that's what it means to be um, a Muslim activist. But this is this is nonsense. This is a compromising Islam. This is uh, distorting Islam. Uh, what is your definition of a strong Muslimah? 
Strong Muslima is a Muslima who does not bend to the pressure from others telling her not to be a traditional wife, not to be a mother, not to have, you know, children, not to homeschool her children, not to be a homemaker, not to cook and clean for her husband, not to be an obedient wife. The strong Muslima has the strength to prefer Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, over these critics, these people who are either jealous or they're ignorant or they're spiteful, they're hateful. The strong Muslima has the strength to shut all of that nonsense out and follow the Quran and the Sunnah and to um, really uphold the deen in her uh, household. That is a strong Muslima. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, what is your definition of a strong Muslim male? Strong Muslim man is someone who is going to stand for the haq, stand for the truth no matter what, no matter the opposition. He's also uh, going to be principled and he's not going to bend the knee just because he doesn't want to be embarrassed by others, that he doesn't want to feel like he's the odd man out, that he doesn't want to feel like he's going to be blamed, he doesn't fear the blame of the blamers. That is some. Uh, one that we can say is a strong Muslim man. Do you try and contact those that you publicly oppose privately? Uh, sometimes I do or I did um, just out of courtesy. Um, again, if it's someone that I... There are different levels of public mistakes. So in general, if something is a public mistake, then it should be possible to correct that mistake publicly. But sometimes people just make mistakes um, out of forgetfulness or it was a slip, but it doesn't really represent who they are. And in that case, I think it's better to uh, approach the person privately and talk to them and say, you know, I saw this. What happened? You know, is, was that really a mistake? That I think is appropriate. You should, you know, contact the person privately when it's a one off. But the people that I criticize publicly by name are not making one-off, one-time mistakes. They are making major, huge mistakes, and they are defending it, and they are promoting it, and they are persisting in that. That's a different story. When someone is putting out that much batil, then they need to be refuted publicly. And sometimes, if they still resist the correction, then you ramp up your criticism. You start using some mockery. You start really belittling the person. There is gradations to this. So some certain people that I criticize today, I was advising them privately uh, six, seven years ago, and they didn't follow the advice. They persisted in the their mistakes. So then the public corrections came very respectful. Oh, Sheikh, Dr. Fulan, you know, he's not doing the right thing. It was respectful. Then they persisted. Okay, then we're going to be a little less respectful. We're going to be less respectful, and we're going to even start mocking. So there is like a progression that takes place because of their response. In general, do you see some good in those that you oppose publicly? Especially, okay, especially when we say here, we're talking especially the Muslim ones, the Muslim Sunni ones, who they do give da'wah or whatever it may be, but they have some errors. Yeah, if someone is a Muslim, then they have some good in them as a Muslim, and there's no denying it. Uh, so I criticize Muslims, they're Muslims, so that's something good. There's no denying that there's some good in them. As for their dawah, is their dawah good? Uh, no, their dawah is actually very dangerous because if they are mixing in really major errors, like they're promoting uh, gender mixing, they're promoting liberalization, they're promoting LGBT, they're promoting feminism, uh, then they are making those batil ideologies look like they're Islamic. Um, or maybe they're outright calling for reform. Some of these du'at are calling openly saying we need to reform Islam. And yeah, they have a great sirah lecture series. Or they have a great, oh wow, mashallah, he has a great you know, commentary on Arba'in and Nawawi, for example, the hadith collection. Or wow, okay, fine. Uh, that might be good, but it's being used in service of uh, the batil. Because people enjoy that Sira lecture series, that commentary on the Hadith, and it makes them more likely to accept all of the uh, Batil ideologies as well. That makes them more dangerous. So this is this is why I don't say that their Dawah is actually good. Their Dawah is dangerous. What advice do you have for those that disagree with you? Not the the figures themselves, but those online. 
whether, and I'm sure these are the majority, people that they've heard bad things about you or they've seen a clip that someone else has made about you or they've listened to like a very short or small amount of things about you. What's your advice to them? Well, I would just advise to try to look at the bigger picture, try to see some of the other material. That's I get contacted regularly by people who say that, Daniel, I really hated you. I hated your style. But then I found that my you know family member, my sister, my wife, my uh, son, he felt fell into this ideology and he mm. maybe he left Islam or he she took off her hijab or this or that. And then I realized, OK, you I was turned off because you seemed harsh. But now I realize that your harshness was actually justified. I get many comments like that. So I would just say that people who are turned off by my style or the whole idea of accountability or I'm criticizing these ideologies in too harsh of a way. Um, try to consider that maybe my harshness is a product of the danger of these ideologies and maybe you just are not aware of that danger at this time. So that's that's the kind of advice I would give those critics. Last question, point one. Do you think anyone who doesn't like you or disagrees with you has listened to anything that you have posted completely? I, yeah. al I always find that this is... Uh, a big problem with anyone that this says I, I don't like this sheikh or I don't like this speaker or I don't like uh, you know this whatever I say okay have you listened to something that they've said completely especially if you say I disagree about them on this topic have you listened to what they have actually said and I think almost every single time the answer has been no they've never listened to a complete thing from A to Z about what he has to say on that topic and so they've just built their uh, opinion on someone without even understanding what they were saying in the first place there are some people like that. Some of my critics who are like that, they just have an incomplete picture or they really haven't done their homework. But I don't want to dismiss all of my credit critics as just being uninformed. I think the layman, not not like not the figures, not the figures yeah, like yeah. there are laymen who are obsessed. They watch everything that I put out. <laughs> they have done they have written like the reports or they have entire dossier files about, you know, the, the problems that they have with me. So they have read but their hate is based on something else. Their hatred, they can't really show what I'm saying is wrong, Islamically speaking, uh, but they're definitely well aware of the things that I've put out. They have some other problem. Um, one thing that I really wanted to focus on before people can know how to get in contact with you and to watch your stuff is you mentioned jealousy when we spoke about the Muslim man not bending any over or bending backwards for those that... Um, attack her and want her to be someone different um, because of jealousy and this is a point that I think a lot of Muslims miss well, Allah SWT mentions in, in the Quran about that disbelievers want us to be like them because of their jealousy from what we're upon and if the Muslim knew that they had the upper hand in morality and the like then that confidence would lead them to not need to look at other philosophies or isms in order for them to be uh, strong happy content etc wala tahsabanna allaha ghafilan amma ya'malu adh-dhalimun inna ma yawakhkhirum liyawmin tashkhasu fi al-absar muhti'ina muqari'ina سيم لا يرتد إليهم طرف موافدة مع وذر الناس يوم يأتيهم العذاب فيقول الذين ظلموا فيقول الذين ظلموا ربنا نجب دعوتك ونتبع الرسل أولم تكونوا وقسمتم من قبل ما لكم من زوال وسكنتم
تم فی مساکین الذین ظلموا انفسهم وتبين لكم وتبين لكم كيف فعلنا بهم وضربنا لكم الأمثال وقد مكروا مكرهم وعند الله مكرهم وإن كان مكرهم لتزول منه الجبال فلا تحسبن الله مخلف وعدي رسوله إن الله عزيز ذو انتقام